me, is it on? Okay, so I thought what we'll do for the wrap up, anybody who is sitting on this, <coughs> in this round area, uh, you were all participants in the meeting, in the round table, so if you have any ideas, thoughts that you feel you didn't get a chance to express properly or any conclusions you draw or any questions you have, this is the time to discuss that. And then uh, after a brief period of that, we'll see if there are any questions from the remaining audience and then that's it. So, Siri. Yeah, I have a question for the, um, uh, the psychosis Binswanger people and actually anyone else who wants to contribute. And, and there, there are two points. Um, one is relating uh, the bipolarity of Valbog's thinking um, to, or the continuum from one pole to another to um, the psychotic disorder and manic depression. And the other thing that's very interesting, um, and I, I know someone who may answer this, is the question of cosmology and psychosis. When I was uh, teaching writing as a volunteer at the Payne Whitney Psychiatric Clinic for almost four years, I had a lot of psychotic patients in my classes, and they were highly cosmological thinkers. And I mean, they would bring together all kinds of different cosmologies into one and write about it. it was very interesting, so I wanted to know from scientists and, and, and psychoanalysts alike what the connection between cosmology, psychosis, and Valbog. That's it. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more than that. <laughs> bon. uh, Francois, for, that's your... You're the, 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 no, you're the for, psychiatrist. Yes, for the first... Uh, question I think uh, I discussed we discussed <coughs> this morning together it is the relation to the meaning to the excess of the meaning and uh, we can discuss th the psychosis like um, like said Lacan an inconscient à ciel ouvert an open sky unconscious with the direct access to the things. In other schools, we can speak about a symbolic equ equ equation. It is the fact that for us, for neurotic, it's very difficult to interpret the world. But for a psychotic, he has a direct access to the meaning. Yeah, but it, it, the bipolar this is for psychotic in general. For bipolar, is also the question of humor, humor, the depression, and the uh, boy. It's for me for Warburg. It's difficult to do really the difference because at the time of Warburg to say it is a psy maniacal depressive psychosis. It was a psychotic structure, and if we see the the different description of uh, Warburg uh, state during. Uh, uh, Bins, in the clinic of Binswanger, he was really uh, in a psychotic access with delirium, with uh, uh, psychotic anxiety, with um, uh, a new world, uh, with persecution, with projection, with uh, dissociation. And uh, bon. Alors, the question remains the same that we discussed this morning. Why invite this kind of uh, State, he has an access to something which is inaccessible in, a, uh, in another state. For, for cosmology, I think it is important. For example, it was uh, Bispo who, from, from Brazil, from Rio, uh, who created a cosmological uh, code with all the world inside the, the, the code. And both. It's true. I think less in Kreuzlingen, obviously, that less in the Bellevue Clinic, but more actually in the theories before, where he's actually articulating a bipolar theory of, um, you know, emotion, 
essentially, and how but, it appears um, in the images. Yes, yeah. uh, I, uh, I want to say something about the bipolar. I, I've written a small article called The Eternal CISO, uh, where there's always movement. He never occupies either one pole or the other. I agree, and I say that. And in fact, uh, he has a little figure striding and standing up on the CISO in the middle. That's a very difficult position to keep for yeah. several decades, right? Yeah. Uh, it's much safer to either sit on one side or the other. And you have to keep your balance dynamically for so long. So, uh, and that has to do also with his later critics that want to position him either on the one side or the other side of the Enlightenment or the irrational Kant or Nietzsche. <clears throat> it's never either or. Uh, it's a position in between. Uh, and next to polarity, there's the other term, Ausgleich, that Martin Wrangler has written, which in English is called, uh, not exactly ba balance, but it's not a, a static balance. The balance is always dynamic. You're always sort of oscillating between the two. And compensation as a kind of economic term. But I don't like balance. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's always uh, dynamic, and there's never exact uh, safe positioning in the polarity. In fact, he energizes the polarity by making it unstable. Well, I, I think the question is how, uh, perhaps you, you will give the answer, because I, for me it, not, it is not the good way to do a discussion about psychosis of Warburg. It's more important to understand how this kind of mental status open to something new, like he was creating, in effect we are now in New York, uh, hundred years after, discussing about Warburg, each one perhaps, each of, uh, we have, each one have his own Warburg, it's my impression after this, this discussion. We have different Warburg views and we are taking lessons from Warburg in different point of view, but uh, uh, for me the, the question of bipolarity is interesting for the notion of pathos formal, perhaps. What, what can we learn from a, a, a pathos? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know nothing of psychosis, of course. Uh, I just wanted to recall the fact that uh, when Warburg uh, describes himself in terms uh, of uh, sort of uh, autobiographical image uh, as a, a psychohistorian, trying to uh, explore and understand the visual history of the West has taken between two extremes, uh, mania and melancholy, uh, the ecstatic nymph and the melancholic god, uh, of the river god. Um, there, of course, you have a polarity of figures. And this polarizerum, as, uh, as he says, he thought uh, at a certain time it was uh, his own invention, his own uh, creative invention uh, as a historiographical category. But there is a very interesting entry uh, in his diary, in his journal, as early as 1907, where he says, uh, I'm reading Goethe's uh, Metamorphosis of Plants, and I find there the notion of polarity, polarité, polarisation. What I thought was my own <laughs> idea, but all is there, all is there in Goethe. And I think I have tried also personally to to explore this background, which is morphological. And morphological means that you never understand one phenomenon if you do not see <coughs> both forces in it. So that pathos formal, exactly, is, is the fact that you have a formal, which is not a form, which is both a form and the repetition, or the possibility of repetition of this form, the formula, mm -hmm. which immediately expresses a pathos, but can be electrotechnically inverted, polarized in this sense, uh, even mm -hmm. from uh, these electrotechnical metaphorics we were talking about it before. So it can become, uh, as we said many times during these round tables, uh, the Menad and the Magdalene, the, the healing serpent and the poison serpent and so on. Mm. But Goethe is there. Just to follow up, I, I would um, like to invite you to 
since you you wrote extensively on this topic, uh, you were mentioning uh, uh, Warburg's reading of uh, Goethe, the Goethe searching for the Urpflanze. So, um, could you tell us more about uh, this sort of uh, trail? Uh, recurrent in, in the history of images of iconology, trying to link uh, symbolic forms with uh, uh, their biological origin, and perhaps bringing in uh, pit rivers and the like? I, I'll, I'll try quickly, <laughs> which is not easy. <laughs> Um, of course, the question of the Ur, of the origin of the Ur built, uh, that has already come out during the discussions, um, is rooted in Goethe's morphological thought. And Goethe, as we know, uh, understood this idea of um, natural research uh, not as a dilettantistic uh, approach to um, study of nature, but on the contrary, as the other side of, 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 of the moon, meaning that uh, uh, a novel, a love novel as the elective affinities can be understood as well as a chemical treatise, a theory of attractions and repulsions of nature, of uh, sympathies and antipathies, of, of magnetism as well. So it, 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 it must be, he must be read as a holistic uh, author in, in this sense. Or uh, we find already in Goethe, I think, uh, a tension, which is to be found uh, afterwards in Warburg as well, between um, historical understanding of the Ur and a properly morphological. Uh, when Goethe uh, was looking for the Urpflanze, for a certain time, he was convinced that the Urpflanze was the first plant that ever that that had appeared at, at the beginning of the world, and and he was convinced that he had found it in the Ginkgo biloba. The Ginkgo biloba was the most ancient plant uh, on Earth. From the Jingo biloba, every other plant um, had derived, according to this first historical approach to this notion of the Ur. But then going to Italy, there, there, there's a letter to Herder from Palermo's, Palermo Botanical Gardens. And there he understands, and, and of course his reading of Kant is very important as well, because he speaks of a transcendentalist blood. Uh, <laughs> transcendental leaf, leaf uh, meaning that uh, Ur is not something that you have to look for on the timeline, the first point on the line, of the chronological line. From that point, everything else in the vegetable uh, phenomena descends and arrives. Uh, Ur is rather the theme never given sort of uh, Wittgenstein perhaps would say, Wittgenstein who was a morphologist as well, Goethean morphologist as well, would talk perhaps of family resemblance. So you recognize the theme among all the vegetable phenomena. <coughs> During um, processes of uh, uh, condensation, of expansion, uh, al um, how do you say, allungamento? Lengthening. Lengthening or, or, or uh, compressing any vegetable phenomenon is the leaf. So it, it can become the roots, it can become the branches, it can become the trunk. And, and the same uh, can be said for the osteological system. So when he speaks of the Ur virbel, the, ur, the originary vertebra, and, and he sees that it, it can become the, the bones of the leg, of the skull, in a metamorphosis, you recognize the vertebra, but you never actually see it in itself, uh, only varied. So uh, if, you want, if you want to use a, a musical metaphor, we could say we don't have the theme, but we just have variations. Variations of a theme that is never given in itself, but only in its variations. <laughs> 
And, and if you look at the panels of the Nemozune Atlas, where is the nymph? You have variations of a theme, of a pathos form, that is there in any, <coughs> every nymph that you look at, but never exhausted in any single nymph. So you can look at the golf player, at the, at the servant of the Ghirlandaio, of the um, archaic maenad, and, and, and this, I think, is a morphological approach. Theme never given, but in its variations. Um, this is um, this tension between a historical approach to the Ur and a morphological is to be found in Barbuk as well. For example, when he studies Manet, and he says Manet is not a, a, a new author. The Déjeuner sur l'herbe is not uh, la nouveauté absolue. <laughs> it's something that has roots in uh, Giorgione, in Marcantonio Raimondi, in a drawing by Raphael, unfortunately lost, in a, a, a relief uh, in, 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 the, in the wall of Villa Medici in Rome. And so he needs to reconstruct the historical chain, going back to the model. So he has an, a traditional idea of the Ur as the origin. But, uh, as we know, many uh, links in this chain are missing. And moreover, if you go back to an Hellenistic model, you cannot say you have found the origin, because you can ask for a, a Greek origin and for an archaic Greek origin and oriental origin and so on. So the quest for the origin transforms itself rather in a morphology. So it's not important to put all these figures in a timeline chronologically oriented, but rather to think them, I would say, in a radial scheme. At the center of the scheme, you have the pathos formula. And around the scheme, you have the figures that gather around the mother, as Goethe said, of the phenomena, of the or phenomenon, <clears throat> like a mother that gathers around herself the, the children. And you have the, 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 this, this network of uh, phenomena. And I think that each panel of the Mnemosyne Atlas is organized like that, like sort of a gathering of children around a, a mother theme that is never given. Uh, Warburg is uh, one author of a very complex um, uh, landscape, morphological landscape in uh, late 19, early 20th century, that has never been reconstructed yet, yet in uh, its uh, density, in its complexity. And I would call it this morphological paradigm in the humanities, in anthropology, in art history, we, found, we find it in uh, Jolles' uh, linguistics. The Einfache Formen is a morphological approach. Prop, morphology of the folk tale. Uh, some structuralism, gestalt psychology. So really many, many, many fields. And I think linguistics. Ostov, uh, uh, formalism, Russian formalism, Uxkul, this idea of, of, of course, uh, a morphology of lifestyles. Although, uh, if we think about Darwin and the expression of morphological qualities of the expression of emotions in animals and humans, as everyone has, as many people have noted, an important book for, an important book for Vavok, um, there is a chronological element there that perhaps you're downplaying so much. I mean, the, I agree with you that Walburg is not, like Walter Benjamin, is not interested in Ursprung as a chronological beginning point. But yet, if we look at the panels, they, are, they do move from antiquity to the present day. So he is offering us an historical atlas, one that proceeds moves forward. I agree. In, in fact, I was talking of a tension, because I don't think that Barbour 
uh, um, is emancipated completely from the traditional historical approach. On the contrary, he feels the tension between this and, and he feels attracted by the traditional historical task to reconstruct the timeline, the chronology of the phenomena. And this is there, together with the other side. Uh, when Spiro says it's never one or the other, but you have to think in between. And moreover, if you read The Origin of the Species by Darwin, there is a paragraph on morphology. He knew very well Goethe, and he says, morphology is the mother of our problems. <laughs> so uh, even in, in this depth that uh, Warburg has toward Darwin, you can see uh, in transparency uh, Goethe as well again. And, and I mean, to complicate or to swing the pendulum just a bit further, it, doesn't Freud discuss school, the school, Raphael's school of Athens in, in, in the Traumdeutung as a kind of syn synchrony of, of, of symptoms of, of, of appearances? I seem to recall. Uh, yes. Freudian here. <laughs> the Freudians don't remember it. Not responsible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not responsible. I too, I don't remember. <laughs> Perhaps uh, the impression. I'm pretty sure he does. <laughs> but per downstairs. But perhaps uh, <clears throat> an important question, uh, which was in the origin of our meeting here and uh, of uh, our discussion was the question of uh, plasticity, dynamic memory, and unconscious. And the purpose was to revisit uh, the new vision of unconscious and uh, memory with the information of uh, contemporary neurosciences. And I think it will be interesting to discuss a little about that, because we can say there is a dynamic memory today in the vision of neurosciences. <clears throat> Very dynamic memory, <clears throat> and the question for neurosciences is the uh, di diachronic identity. Where come from the diachronic identity? We, if we are always changing, from where uh, the permanence of yourself the permanence of your reference, of your history, will come from. And perhaps we have a paradox, as we discussed before, that in biology we have permanent change, and in cultural uh, point of view, you have something which is more in the dialectic of memory as a conservation, as continuity. And I think the discussion about continuity and discontinuity in the dynamic process of memory is interesting to, to, to have it change the point of view. Now for a classical psychoanalyst, we are thinking about psychoanalysis, about uh, human sciences as the, the, the field of the, the possibility to change, and biology as determinism, programmation, uh, fixed structures. And, with the new paradigm of plasticity, you have an inversion of the of the representation, perhaps more uh, more mobile in biological structure and more immobile in in cultural structures. In the, the well, is a pity that the memory people are not here anymore. <laughs> Well, but, yes, it's Pierre. <laughs> yeah, Pierre it's knows. Uh, and I know psychoanalytic Pierre memory, he knows. <laughs> but, we can manage. But, yeah, I was wondering, in fact, myself, about what we were discussing, this, they were discussing, you were discussing this morning, because uh, is indeed one of the, the most interesting things that at least I think for neuroscience came out from this Warburg meeting. Um, the thing is that the, the memory was discussed this morning is in fact somehow very fixed and very flexible. I mean, you speak of a synaptic trace, which is something that really deeply change your brain. Everything you, you hear, you listen, you do can change through the plasticity of your brain. But uh, 
still is a dynamic thing, so ongoing even during this, these days, we are carrying on changing. But we perceive ourselves and our identity as a stable, at least if we don't run into the pathology, as stable in space and time. So I was wondering if what you were saying about the variation and the theme could be somehow applied in trying to understand memory, but not as a synaptic trace, because it's like explaining vision with the functioning of cells in V1, V2, or colors in V4. There is something more. There is, you know, our story is, a, is also a nar narrative story of our self. It's something, and it's not only about learning. What Christina was saying, memory is something you learn. I'm not sure is something you learn, is something you experience, something you, you go through, something that changed. Yesterday, Vittorio was saying, we are, we are made of bricks, but you can change the disposition of these bricks. And somehow the bricks can be the variation around the theme. <coughs> and so the dynamic aspect of memory could be the, not the, this the, variation. The, the, yeah, the, the creative and, and plastic aspect uh, that both uh, reproduces and produces. I, I, I was thinking, uh, listening to this idea of plasticity, of course, of the very famous passages in, 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 in Proust, uh, or on, in, even in, in certain phenomenology, but even in all those authors that have insisted on the retroactive uh, Ret retrograde uh, a movement of, of truth. Uh, Bergson has a beautiful conference on that. The Aprecoud in Achtreglichkeit, Borges when he says that Kafka creates his precursors. <laughs> or uh, Thomas Elliot that says in Tradition and Individual Talent that uh, when uh, a new author appears uh, in the scene, in the literary landscape, the old history has to be rewritten. So, um, briefly, the, the, the present shapes the past, the past shapes the present, and you have, again, this in-between in of passivity and activity, a chiasmatic relation, if you want to use the Merleau-Pontian notion. And I, I'm not a, a neuroscientist, but uh, yeah, from your uh, comments and, and discourses, uh, uh, about plasticity, I immediately connected them to this constellation of problems, uh, which is exactly, even in Warburg, the idea that uh, he says uh, the Laocon uh, should have been invented if it was not there, meaning that uh, Renaissance uh, is, is a construction, is, was there a certain amount of phenomena, but there's a retrograde uh, create creative uh, uh, in, uh, installation of this notion of renaissance uh, as an après coup. I, I think so, yeah. there is a, go ahead. No, but I mean, just to um, stress again, the notion that one dimension of plasticity is that it allows experience to leave traces by modifying synapses that are facilitated and then when they are reactivated that somehow reproduce the experience, more or less. Uh, and at the same time, uh, particularly this idea that whenever, and it's not an idea, it's actually an experimental uh, uh, observation, that when traces are reactivated, as Christina mentioned, they are becoming labile, more fragile, or more susceptible to associate with, uh, with others with a, a new concept. So <clears throat> nothing is lost, really but uh, it's updated uh, permanently. So this is in a way uh, to try to grasp this notion of permanence and at the same time of uh, continuous change, which is something that is paradoxical because you, you would uh, say, you know, memory is something that is there, uh, you know, once and forever. And, and this is really the evolving notion that it's true, but at the same time, it's susceptible to change. and. Um, all the mechanisms are not known, actually, but, but certainly this possibility of reassociation of traces uh, 
So uh, a given trace is now put <coughs> into, uh, associated with others in a new context, um, pro produces this, uh, this, this uh, change in a way. Yes, it well, is important because we have to revisit the relation between nature and culture. If we can say that it is a permanent change, we can say also that we are, as we said in our books, we are biologically determined not to be completely biologically determined. We are biologically determined to be free. And finally, we can say in this, uh, this, this discussion that we are biologically determined, determined to receive the incidence of the culture. And that the, the idea, the space for the culture is inside also the biology of the, the, and after it is the question, why is it like that? Why is it necessary? Yeah? The, 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 the incidence of the culture, we are unachieved at birth. We need the other, well, this is a psychiatric, psychoanalytic point of view, we need the action of the other, and we can develop these ideas, the, discussing about the necessity of the culture, which is inside the biological organization. I, I, uh... I, I found the, the discussions very uh, interesting and thought-provoking. In particular, I have been thinking about the issue of memory. So for a psychoanalyst, there is a, there is a relevance and history to the concept of memory because uh, Breuer, uh, Freud, with his experience with Charcot and then on his own, uh, discovered that certain uh, manifestations in a patient, certain symptoms, could be traced back to a specific memory. And that the bringing into awareness of that specific memory would alter the symptoms. In that way of looking at it, memory is a very discrete entity. So what we call memory trace, so that there are all these traces, they are discrete entities. But when you start thinking uh, from the perspective of, uh, let's say, plasticity, when uh, you and Joe this morning say, well, the brain changes after this meeting or during this meeting, the brain changes, what is memory in that? There isn't a discrete, so uh, the whole question of, uh, and then the other thing is Christina says, well, there is learning. Well, there's learning, there's experience, and there is what Freud didn't really uh, directly uh, touch upon, though it's inherent in the concept of free associations, is that it's not like you have a discrete experience and that experience stays isolated. It must be that all experiences are affecting each other forwards and backwards in a dynamic way. And so to, within this way of seeing, it's difficult to speak of uh, memory in the usual sense we speak of it. Uh, there may have to be a, a different approach to understanding exactly what it is that is happening. That is, and even, um, and I think once you start thinking that way, the, the Freudian dynamic unconscious becomes something that needs to be revisited. Yes. And perhaps the, the limit between memory, dynamic memory, and dynamic unconscious, Freudian unconscious, is less clear than before. Yeah. For us, we consider that uh, unconscious was, Freudian theory is not a, a memory system. But if we enter in plasticity, dynamic memory, we have, uh, 
something new in the confrontation between unconscious and memory. And finally, it's easier to understand what is unconscious than what is memory. Well, but you know, there, there, in, you know in, in, in classical Freudian thinking, unconscious or dynamic unconscious is connected to the notion of repression, which means the memory is not becoming conscious for a reason. Whereas it may be that memory is not becoming conscious because just further from being whatever needs to bring it into awareness, into consciousness, is not happening. So if you don't listen to that piece of music for 30 years, that memory, you could say, is unconscious. You could even say in a speculative Freudian way, you kept that memory out of your consciousness because it happened during your adolescence. You were sexually into this and it kept it. But it may just be that you didn't have the method of access, accessing it. And when you accessed it with a repeat of the same music, it came right back. No, but this gives a very discreet perspective or retrieval too. So, and, and your example was uh, incredibly good in showing that even the retrieval aspect of memory is not discrete. Right. You don't have to act exactly. this portion. So I think what I was just uh, in a delirium thinking of your description of the resonant, you know, this variation around the theme, it would, be, would give to memory a more complex structure. So I don't know exactly how it could be formalized, but... Um, I think... The difficulty of, of, of addressing um, these issues, the relationship between memory and unconscious, uh, the notion of uh, form, where, where the form comes from, the, the problem of the ur, uh, or even uh, the related uh, uh, problem of uh, uh, self-identity, uh, bring us back to uh, a, a key point of our ontology, of our epistemology, which is language. And there's, there's a, a, a passage that keeps obsessing me, which I, I uh, totally, uh, uh, by, by chance, uh, found in, in, in a wonderful book by Primo Levi, uh, The Drawn and the Saved. I don't have the English, but I can. It's, it's very short. Uh, I have the Italian one what we commonly uh, uh, conceive of as understanding, he writes, uh, coincides with simplifying. Without uh, a, a deep simplification, the world around us uh, would be an endless, uh, undefined knot that would challenge our ability to orient and decide upon our action. We are, um, to put it simply, uh, forced to reduce the knowable to a schema. And this is the specific purpose of uh, the wonderful instrument we built in the course of evolution and which are specific of the human species. Language and conceptual thought. So, I think Primo Levi here is, is dealing with a completely different uh, issue, what does it mean to survive Auschwitz, uh, uh, what does it mean to, to feel guilty of something, etc. But if you somehow uh, use this as a starting point to, to reflect upon many of the themes we have been discussing during uh, these days, uh, I think that the notion of, of identity can be much better tackled uh, from, from our point of view, from the neurobiological point of view, if you interpret it as, uh, uh, as a process and not as... So there is no such a thing in the brain as the self. Uh, the self is a process, a dynamic process, which in a way is a way not to answer in the question, okay, a process of what? <laughs> so then the neurobiologist desperately needs something to grab uh, in order not to be uh, completely drawn in this uh, 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 sort of uh, indeterminacy, uh, universal indeterminacy. And this something to grab on are the bricks, 
that metaphorically speaking I was alluding to. So going back to Warburg, uh, Francois said uh, each of us has probably her or his own Warburg. One of the things that uh, really uh, struck me uh, of Warburg is his definition of the history of art as the history of uh, human pragmatic expression, which immediately in my, in my head uh, uh, um, suggested the possibility not to naturalize the history of art, that's not the way to put it, but at least the attempt to naturalize the process of morphogenesis. And then uh, Warburg reading of Goethe and the tradition that uh, um, Andrea was uh, very briefly referring to offer a sort of uh, kind of uh, uh, very remote but not totally uh, 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 crazy uh, goal, uh, which is specifically that of looking for possible biological roots of symbolic forms. And I think that in that respect, uh, Warburg uh, uh, definitely, at, at the very least, uh, uh, I don't see him as standing uh, against this project, but I think that reading, uh, by reading Warburg, perhaps in my very own idiosyncratic way, I think Warburg would, uh, would, would nod <laughs> uh, uh, and would encourage uh, this sort of search. Um, and, uh, and then I will, I will stop. Uh, the notion of uh, a form that is not the, the primitive form, but uh, being instantiated in a variety of ways uh, still keeps some constant aspect, reminds me of uh, uh, the notion discussed by Agamben radicalizing uh, uh, paradeknumai, uh, the notion of paradigm uh, by Aristotle. So according to Warbur, uh, sorry, to, to Agamben, uh, this is specific uh, of uh, our species, the possibility to uh, achieve something that cannot be universal, but being paradigmatic uh, becomes, uh, uh, so, so to speak, by means of decoupling, something from his usual uh, reference role. He makes the example of Rosa. Uh, rose is a word referring to a biological object, but when decoupled from uh, his role of referring to something in the physical world, when it becomes uh, one uh, element of the Latin declination, Rosa, Rose, uh, it doesn't refer to any specific rose, it becomes a paradigm. So I believe uh, the same logic can perhaps be applied to the notion of morphogenesis and can be perhaps fruitfully tackled uh, uh, from an biological point of view. So that's uh, the main reason why we decided to confront scribbles uh, uh, with the Chinese ideograms uh, and uh, alphabetic Roman letters. So, and if I had uh, the, the power to do it, uh, one project I would really like to, to pursue would be to look among all known possible uh, writing uh, uh, that we know uh, uh, along uh, uh, human history, to look for specific biomechanical uh, constraint, kinematic bricks that somehow, so, I mean, the way we are, it's a dynamic process. I am not the same as I was uh, 20 years ago. Before becoming a father, my attention started one meter uh, uh, above the ground. Whatever was moving below one meter didn't exist for me. Now, all of a sudden, I become a father. I, I discover the world is full of children, of uh, this kind of thing. So I'm not anymore uh, the Vittorio or uh, uh, the single um, playboy, etc., etc. <laughs> <laughs> Some a different person. Um, so the idea is that this is something that can 
can be investigated. And I think Warburg, in a way, is, uh, can be a source of inspiration. But I, I, uh, I mean, what, maybe I'm just reading what you say in light of what I think, but the, the point I, I made this morning about <coughs> uh, these um, hardwired, um, uh, maybe neuronal circuits, in a way, that uh, uh, respond to certain uh, archetypal or biomechanical shapes and patterns, uh, I mean, for me, uh, can be related to, to what uh, Warburg has identified as persisting over time. And then, of course, uh, based on this, they can reemerge and be reinterpreted and, being, and, and, and find a, an, an, uh, their life on their own through plasticity, through the culture, through a given moment in time. But, but there is a, a, a const, an invariant throughout uh, uh, time and cultures uh, that is based on some biological yeah, property. Well, so I think we, we share the same point. But it might be interesting to make a distinction between images and text, right? Between images and language. And it's interesting that foul books seem to have um, he really had a hard time with, with writing. I mean I, I mean, I don't know what your experience is, but my experience of reading Valborg is God was not only in the details, but he got lost in the details. And you can feel a certain compulsive inability <clears throat> to extract. Let alone the handwriting. You know, exactly, and then stopping the project. So you ha we have to think about that. There was something, but, and when he came to Numosina, the, uh, really he didn't get the text done, right? He died before the text was finished, but the idea of these pictures speaking, and you know, Freud talks about um, mental images, not external images, but mental images as phylogenetically and ontologically older, of course, than language, which we know they are. So it would be interesting to hear people talk about this distinction, which is related to conceptual questions and uh, morphology. I, I love the example of Primo Levi, because I mean, Volvo would ascribe to it immediately in the sense that this is how, what he thought, and Vischer and, and, the, and the Viconians that he was reading, this is what the symbol is. But then I would just want to add to that and complicate that with what Andrea, uh, by mentioning invoking Goethe and the Goethean symbol, was precisely what Walburg did not want to have because for him the symbol had to be discursive, it had to be ed uh, endlessly metonymic, it couldn't have that romantic Goethean symbolic power because it was, it was too complicated, it was too oscillating, it was too um, unstable. I, I, I My impression I, is that, the, um, in fact, in between there is uh, the tradition Kreutzer Bachofen. That is, a symbol is something, something dense, complex. When you narrate it and you describe it, you have the exegesis of the symbol, and then you have the myth. And then you, you recount the history of the serpent as Asclepius, and so you decline and you inflect it towards the good, towards the positive pole. Otherwise, you can describe it and uh, recount and narrate it uh, in the myth of Laocoon. So the exegesis determines the symbol and its density it to, towards a it. direction, pardon? But it also undermines it. It, it, does, it doesn't allow it simply to be the serpent or the flag or the chalice. It, it becomes <clears throat> iconographic as but well as iconologic. I have a question to, to your argument, your excellent argument of uh, Victor Ganesi. Uh, we are speaking about biological roots of form. And I ask me if it is biological roots or a biological necessity of the form. Because something is missing in the program of the human being. 
We are without uh, instruction for use. We are unachieved at birth. And we need also something from the other. And perhaps we need the form. It, for me, it's different to say uh, the, perhaps it's the same, it is different, it is, uh, but it is important that not the biological root, if, like if it was inscribed in your, uh, our program, but the biological necessity of the form. It's like, it's like the distinction, excuse me, like you, you discuss, like the socio between language and speech. The, each act of act of speech, speech act, each speech act modify the system of the language. And we, you, you have this kind of dialectic with an endless permanent change. Always the necessity of the form, but the possibility not to find the, the true uh, ur form, but to, to recreate permanently, endless, a new form from another form. And for me, Warburg is very interesting because in Nemosine, he, he put together different kinds of form that are unified by their necessity and not by the common root. Uh, if, if I could pick up on what you say about text and image, I was reminded listening this morning and now that in fact in Warburg late years, which are dedicated to his own recovery, there's two great works that have the same title, that is Mnemosine. The first is the Builder Atlas and the second is the library, so you have yeah. text and image. And this also reminded me of, um, of a very short text that I give to students when I introduce the library and you know, they expect you know, how to find your reading list, etc. And I read a very short text by Varbo, which describes the library as an of clarum waffe, a weapon of enlightenment. <laughs> and to me, that, that seems to be a very powerful way of inverting his phobia with God and turning the library into something very dynamic and very organized at the same time, because the library has a, quite a clear organization. It's organized chronologically, there's no alphabetical order, so it represents time, and it also is um, subdivided by space. So it's indeed a, a space of, uh, of self-healing and of creating a space where he can navigate himself. Hello? Uh, this isn't a, a direct response to what has been said, um, but when you refer to the library as a weapon, I think that it's something to bear in mind. And that is Varbarg's relationship to the world around him, which was very close, very attentive, very conscious and self-conscious. Um, when we speak of his identity, um, it was something very problematic for him in a socio-political sense. And that includes his family, includes religious background, and he was constantly negotiating this. Uh, with himself, within the family, with others, and and who he was socio-politically um, was was on his mind, and that the creation of the of the library, right, was not just a an intellectual act, not just a a projected psychological one, but a, a socio-political one, and one that he negotiated with his family, through his family, and and that continual concern with you know, where he fit within the society, the politics of his time, his identity with his class, with his state, but his problems with that, um, his identity with Judaism and his ambivalence there, um, his attention, as Peter pointed out, to, to, to anti-Semitism and what he could do about that. Um, this remained constantly of importance to him. And so all I would say is that in the discussion of his, his intellectuality and his relationship to, to the intellectual traditions with which he's dealing, I think his, his socio-political sense and background um, just sort of helps in some way to understand what stays with him, what he decides to pursue. That, that little aphorism fits very well into what you said because it continues the library as a weapon of enlightenment against the orthodox dogmaticism, then he says, Luther, the French Revolution, science, liberating the right to think for oneself. Mm. So I think that, that really fits very, very squarely into that, that discourse. You know, as I've been listening to the way that 
each of us has been thinking about Warburg, you know, I wonder if in one sense he's an ego ideal of something that uh, uh, the psychoanalyst Rothenberg referred to a Janusian process of thinking after the Roman god Janus, where there's an active and intentional conception of two or more opposites simultaneously that is very much like primary process thinking with the equivalence of opposites, but is actually a conscious, intentional, rational process that also <coughs> obeys reality testing. And that this is something that we recognize, perhaps, in Vorberg. And so many of the comments have been attempts, rather than maybe trying to find the middle ground, reconciling opposites, whether this, a kind of, there was kind of an Aristotelian and Platonic <laughs> undercurrent to, to what, what yes, you were, yes, and, and, it's, <laughs> and it's not finding the midpoint, but we're all sort of, you know, um, I, I think in a way, uh, fashioning our thinking after Vorberg, and this is what I think we see as so ideal about, about him. I, I, in this context, I want to bring up the seismograph. Um, you know, Valborg really felt that he, he was a seismograph. And if you think about it, I've, I've had this a, a much humbler uh, metaphor about my own nerves, which is a tuning fork. You see how humble that one is compared to the seismograph. But the seismograph is, you know, picking up earthquakes. Uh, and you feel this in the sensibility. And this might be... This is obviously personal, it's subjective, and I have noticed that you know, people want to walk very carefully for r human and good reasons, respectfully, around the subjective reality of what it was like to be Abhi Valbuk, that we can't know, of course, but we can guess through this particular metaphor of the seismograph that he was a person who was picking up a lot and you feel it in, this, in the psychotic material, and you feel it before that, and you feel it after. It, even in 29, he uses the metaphor of the antenna as well. Yes, there you go, the same thing. Okay, mm. I think we could stop here and be open for questions. If there are any. No, you want to make one last comment before we close? <laughs> I, I, yeah, because because uh, Siri introduced this this very delicate issue, um, text, image, and of course uh, in visual culture studies, it's a main issue: word versus image. I was wondering whether um, exactly uh, reading uh, and Warburg and looking at Warburg, meaning looking at at the panels, we are not perhaps. Uh, two radically op opposing these two systems and, and, and registers, um, both for uh, our past and uh, the etymological uh, reason, that is uh, the Greek verb graphene means both to depict and to write. And the same happens in ancient uh, Egyptian language, in Gothic language, uh, Vittorio was mentioning uh, the Chinese uh, uh, ideograms, pictograms. Uh, we encounter um, text and image, icon texts, as, as many people in the visual culture say, in advertising, in, uh, on the web, uh, in our books, uh, even on the panels of Nemozune. So I was wondering, and I, uh, I'd like to ask you as neuroscientists, if such a, a division between, a separation between um, the responses and the reactions and the processes in the brain with words and with images, is, is something useful or if we shouldn't rather develop uh, a method to approach uh, in a holistic way? the whole thing? Well, short answer and we I mean, uh, perhaps abandoning, I, I'm not sure how the uh, actual uh, present day neuroscientific research goes on exploring world versus image. Uh, perhaps my feeling is in a separate way, there are regions 
processing our relationship to words, regions, processing our relationship to images, responses, and so on. Is there a research nowadays questioning the way we uh, respond to iconotexts? Mm. Well, uh, I'm not aware, but that's not, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean necessarily anything. Uh, one, one of the um, uh, very interesting discovery that neuroscience has made uh, recently when it comes to the relationship between uh, uh, symbolic uh, graphic signs and the brain, uh, I'm referring to the research of uh, Stanislav Dehan, uh, of Cohen, uh, people in Paris who have discovered that uh, apparently there is a part of our visual brain which is uh, specifically and uniquely activated uh, by, um, by letters, uh, but not by numbers, for example. So it's not the pragmatic uh, component uh, which uh, specifically leads to this activation, but is uh, something uh, brand new uh, in terms of evolutionary time. It's just an eye blink, 6,000 years of uh, uh, against the history of at least uh, more than 100,000 years. So, uh, what is this? Uh, I tend to uh, be inclined to an exaptation perspective. So I don't think our mind is a, uh, can be described uh, metaphorically as a, sorry, as a Swiss army knife. No, <laughs> with all due respect to this wonderful tool. Uh, but I don't think our mind can be modeled in that particular way. I don't think that every cognitive ability is, uh, is necessarily the outcome of uh, its specific adaptive value, but I stick to uh, Gould and Levantin, uh, the spanners of San Marco famous paper where they, they um, introduced the notion of exaptation. So uh, to put it simply, uh, uh, nature is a sort of bricoleur, uh, so you have uh, something that evolved to uh, answer some specific uh, uh, pressure, and you somehow transform exactly. dynamically. Perhaps you, you use the very same bricks, but the same bricks dynamically connected in a, in a different way can accomplish uh, different things. Uh, so. Uh, what is remarkable is that a trace, a footprint, for an animal at best uh, can uh, speak of some other animal that was passing by. In our case, the handprint is a sort of uh, vindication of our identity. So I am, I'm, uh, and it's amazing how many uh, handprints are uh, discovered, uh, I have a friend who's an archaeologist, Maurizio Forte. He studies the Neolithic period, uh, Cataluc in, in uh, uh, Anatolia. And he was telling me that uh, all of these houses in a very specific, detailed, very much ritual-like form, uh, there are thousands of, of this, um, this handprint on, on specific walls. Uh, I don't remember if they uh, with respect to, to the cardinal points, there is also a rule in that respect, which is a way of asserting our identity or whatever. I mean, we, we probably will never know. So uh, this is a real challenge for, for a biologist because uh, we are dealing with um, an aspect of human nature that um, to many uh, is beyond any reach of the empirical sciences. I, I tend to be rather optimistic or um, uh, delusional <laughs> <laughs> and think we have a chance. Yeah. OK, we have one comment. And then oh, yeah, I wanted to ask a question, just kind of follow up on that. Um, you know, Kassirer, following Warburg, looked at man as the animal symbolicum. So, and his, Kassirer's example was, give me a line and it's all in the context. It's our ability to bring to that line, whether it's a mathematical graphical formulation or an aesthetic calligraphic expression 
or whether it's a numerical symbol, you know. And so, um, what I find to be interesting, and I wanted to know what uh, the the neurophysiological opinion might be on this, that you know, there's work done by Stephen Kostlin and others that says that the brain actually projects in the visual cortis in the visual cortices iconic resemblances to the uh, affordances that we see, that we pay attention to, that the curves that we see are actually modeled two-dimensionally on surfaces in the cortex, uh, visual cortex. At some point, there's got to be like an interpreter that's grading and evaluating, like maybe the interpreter Gazzaniga talks about. Is there any literature that talks about this? Well, the, the word interpreter is a, is a scary one yes. uh, because uh, you don't want to fall into the homunculus trap. So um, the interpreter is at best an emergent property of the, uh, of the whole system. I, I would put it uh, uh, in that specific way. Uh, vision has been, in my opinion, so far too much studied and conceived of uh, within the limit of vision itself. As um, we were discussing yesterday, uh, unimodality is not the rule, it's the exception in the brain. So synesthesia apparently is rules, okay? And I have the suspect that uh, a very viable rule uh, uh, to glue uh, this otherwise a patchwork-like uh, uh, world of uh, our perceptions of, of, of the world uh, is, um, is action, is the motor system, uh, by means of uh, uh, back projection. So it's not only a matter of top-down effect, like when you see uh, a shaded, uh, um, confused pattern, you don't see anything, then I ask you, oh, don't you see the Dalmatian dog? And all of a sudden, Okay, that's a clear example of a top-down uh, uh, influence on early processing. Um, this role of uh, uh, back projection has been either neglected or not sufficiently explored from a neurobiological point of view. Uh, people who study the visual system from an anatomical point of view uh, systematically uh, emphasize the fact that uh, recurrent connections uh, by and large, exceed feed-forward connection. So there are a lot more fibers that travels back from V1 to the lateral geniculate body than fibers that from the thalamus uh, gets to the primary visual cortex. That, that probably means something, uh, which is, I think, also very um, coherent uh, with, with the notion of perception that has been discussed during these two days. So it's a... Uh, uh, a sort of uh, multimodal, uh, multimodal enterprise. And I think if, if one changed this perspective, even the study of images, uh, the study of iconology uh, can, can have a new boost, I think. We, can, we still have to, to map uncharted territory. That can perhaps uh, give some food for thought also for, for discipline that in principle don't need the contribution of neurobiology, but I think they can profit of, of this contribution, and, okay. and vice versa, of course. Thank you all very, very much, and uh, that's it.